Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the uh, eighth Badger Crop Connect webinar series for 2023. Uh, we are going to wait just, just another minute or so uh, to let a few more people uh, get uh, admitted into the program. Okay, let's let's go ahead and uh, get this started. So, hello, wel welcome to the eighth Badger Crop Connect webinar program for 2023. Uh, my name is Josh Camps, regional crop educator uh, in the southwest corner, Grant Green, Iowa, and Lafayette counties. I will serve as the host today. Uh, the Badger Crop Connect series is, uh, or excuse me, aims to provide timely crop updates for producers, agriculture professionals in Wisconsin uh, throughout the growing season. And uh, this comes as a joint, jointly sponsored program between UW-Madison Division of Extension and Nutrient and the UW-Madison Nutrient and Pest Management Program. Okay, so uh, as a recipient of federal funding, UW Extension must collect information about its outreach efforts. As part of your registration for this event, we requested uh, that you provide your demographic information. Uh, just wanted to assure you all this information is collected, is anonymous, and cannot be tracked back to you. Um, thank you for your assistance, and we will uh, start the webinar soon. Uh, let's see here. Okay, while well, many of you are familiar with virtual presentations, I'm going to go through just a few housekeeping items. Uh, please keep your microphones muted and videos off during the webinar. Uh, the mute and video controls are on the bottom left-hand side of your screen. Also, please feel free to type questions for our presenters into the chat box at any time. The chat button is in the bottom center of your screen. Uh, we will answer as many questions as we can as time allows. Um, if you have any questions or difficulties with Zoom technology, uh, you can type your questions into the chat um, or send an email uh, to Sam Bibby. Um, his information uh, is coming in the chat here now. If you have any difficulties with your audio, the call and information will also be provided in the chat. All right, with that, uh, we will now hear from uh, Dr. Matt Ruark, uh, uw Madison Professor and Extension Specialist. Uh, Matt will be discussing cover crop selection and soil management following corn silage harvest. You can go ahead and share your, share your slides, Matt. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. It's a nice rainy day here in South Central Wisconsin. So, um, you know, I was looking through, you know, the, we got 51 participants on so far. I mean, I, I'd be surprised if there was more than a handful that have not seen some sort of presentation of mine on cover crops. So, you know, I'm going to I'll take this time. I, I kind of viewed this presentation as sort of like a collection of the, you know, the greatest hits, right? Where are we at with some of the research we've done on cover crops? Point us in the right direction. Um, so what probably is going to be more valuable if people have questions, maybe you have some questions going in, just start hit, you know, typing those in the chat. We'll, we'll spend as much time as possible, uh, answering questions that, that might be, you know, that might be general, that could be real specific stuff. But I think what's going to be the case is that, you know, when it comes to cover crops and a lot of our cover crop research, we don't have all the answers, right? There's a lot of ways uh, to get cover crops planted into your system, there's also there's a lot of parts of your crop rotation where it's really easy to get cover crops established well. Uh, there's other parts of your crop rotation where it's almost impossible to get cover crops to establish well. So that's why the, the I really appreciate the the title that we put together here is cover crop selection and management after corn silage. So that works 
really well. So we have, you know, we have upwards of maybe about a million acres of corn silage in the state. What an opportunity to get a million acres of cover crops, right? So we start off with, right, why, why we'd want it. Of course, right, this is a corn silage field after harvest. All the biomass is removed. We've got, you know, we're, we're the, what an opportunity to get something planted, get soil coverage going. Typically, obviously connected with dairy rotations. It's going to come with manure, a lot of, you know, a lot of fall manure application in the state. So those two things kind of sync up, right? I don't, I mean, it'd be interesting to know from, from this group, right, of what, you know, what when you're seeing um, corn silage fields, and there's cover crops being used. Is it are those you know cover crops on corn silage fields typically following a manure application or not? Um, so you know a lot of the research in the state has really been revolved around that idea. So right, so I like to also kind of you know vision it this way. We've got uh, we've got corn silage. We've harvested it. We're getting that cover crop to grow. We want to get some growth in that fall. Looking for some erosion control. Have it survive the winter. Or maybe we don't need to survive the winter. We'll talk about that and hopefully have some conversations about that. Oops, sorry. Um, in the wrong direction. Then what's the effect on that next crop? That's the big one, right? So we've seen any, I mean, we see effects from incredibly positive to incredibly negative following cover crops. And so let's dial in and figure out what we can do to, to reduce that agronomic risk. Well, maximizing the benefit to soil and groundwater. So um, what's been interesting, you know, is that there, you know, so I like to start too, we, we're, we're going to show a lot of uh, Wisconsin specific data here. But there's a lot of, you know, a lot of data throughout the, the US um, North and all of North America that, that, you know, there's a lot of cover crop studies. So do cover crops do what we think they're going to do? For, for most of the time, the answer is yes. All right, so do cover crops reduce nitrate leaching? The answer is yes. So this is a meta-analysis across 28 studies in North America, so mostly U.S. and Canada. And they found the non-legume covers, so mostly, mostly grasses, a few brassicas, uh, we're looking at about, on average, it reduces nitrate leaching by 50%. Uh, legumes tend to not have that big water quality benefit, but there's certainly a lot less studies um, that, that, are, that are being done with legging cover crops and, and water quality. But the grasses, they do what they think they're going to do. You know, we're looking at about a 50% reduction. So as we think about, you know, as you know, we're interacting with watershed groups, um, maybe some large CAFOs that are, that are really keen on, okay, how do I reduce nitrate leaching in my, in my farming operation, cover crops, um, and non legume cover crops are the way to go. Do they do cover crops increase soil organic matter, or as they measured in the study, the soil carbon? So you can often think about the carbon being about 50% of the organic matter. So if you have about 4% organic matter, you got 2% carbon, right? Does it increase your carbon? So another meta analysis here 37 studies. The answer is yes. It generally is associated here, right? The greater the, you know, the gain in carbon in the soil over time. Uh, so the y-axis here is time, or x -axis, sorry, x-axis time, y-axis increase in carbon. Yep, so it's positively related. The longer you have cover crops, the longer you're using cover crops, the more buildup of carbon you have. But you can see, you know, looking at all this data, pretty messy, right? Not highly predictive. So it's not just about Yes, you're using cover crops for long periods of time. Yes, you will probably see an increase in your soil organic matter or your soil carbon. How much will be driven, although by numerous other factors, right? And that's one of the big challenges for us uh, as researchers or as extension professionals to figure out what are all those other variables, right? Clay content, what's your crop rotation? How much other carbon is going in the system? Is it, or is it mostly a system that has a lot of uh, extraction of carbon? Is there a lot of Biomass removal. Anyway, you know, so you can imagine all of these um, factors in place. What's your tillage uh, that that might affect it? But so not not super predictive, but generally yes. So generally yes, it's a practice uh, to build carbon. And what about soil health? Uh, here we're going to use uh, 
Sorry, let me get rid of uh, rid of that there. Uh, we're going to use microbial abundance and activity as an as an indicator of soil health here. Um, so the uh, base of the microbial biomass carbon, how much, you know, basically what's the abundance and how how active are microorganisms? Generally speaking, following the cover crop. Here's another meta analysis: sixty studies. And it didn't seem to matter too much what the cover crop was. As long as you're using a cover crop, you're adding carbon back to the soil, you're going to see a benefit to your, your soil biology, right? And that it makes sense. You're feeding it more carbon, right? You're, you're adding more roots, you're adding more above ground biomass, uh, material that's probably fairly easy to break down. So you're going to increase uh, your microbial activity. So over the short term, you're going to see a, a short term effect of cover crop on sort of soil health, soil biology, and then also a long-term benefit as well. So, and I don't have on my screen here the, the chat box. So um, if any, if there is stuff in the chat box, just, and it's just interrupt me, we'll, we'll start to address questions. So those are some of the long-term things, right? And that's kind of like the, the main reasons why we'd want to use a cover crop. Although primarily, you know, we don't really talk about this. Do cover crops control erosion? Yes, if they grow, right? So erosion control, number one, you know, get that soil coverage. Two, let's trap some, some nitrate that could leach out over the winter, especially if we've applied manure. And three is, can we start to incorporate this in long-term to maintain or maybe even increase soil organic matter or, or soil health? So those are kind of our long-term goal, our short-term and long-term goals towards sort of, you know, broader sustainability, right? But we've got sort of this, these, but when you're making these decisions about what cover crops to use, how, you know, when should we seed them? Should I use them? You know, what, what are their benefits or drawbacks, especially it's, if connected to a fall manure application? What are all the things that we need to think about along the way? So, um, sorry, my, uh, it's very sensitive here. So we've done a lot of work and most of this work is funded by the Wisconsin Fertilizer Research Council. So I wanna give a big thanks to, to that group um, that, that's funded a lot of this work. But our first work um, that we've done, a, we've done a, some extensive trialing on is to look at the effect of cover crop species and then the biomass that's produced on the nitrogen need of that next corn crop, right? So if we go, if we have part of a rotation where it's corn silage with fall manure, right? And that fall manure from a nutrient management planning perspective is going <clears> to <throat> supply nitrogen to that next crop. And we use, we use some book values. We'll do some maybe manure testing, right? So we have an expectation that there's some nitrogen from that manure that's going to be available to that next corn crop. Well, but if we put that cover crop out there, I'm sorry, that next corn, right? And then if we put a cover crop out there that's taking up some of the nitrogen, is that affect how much nitrogen carries over? And so we got to think about, well, so yeah, is there, uh, is it, is there no effect? Is it, do we need to apply more nitrogen? Can we apply less nitrogen? So uh, we've, we've done some work in, uh, across kind of a range of grass species that may survive the winter or not survive the winter. So these are pictures taken at our Arlington Research Station here uh, in, a, in, in, uh, in the spring where we've got a strip, right? No cover, you know, all that exposed soil. And this is spring barley, which winter kills. So we seeded at a little bit higher rate than maybe what we currently recommend. But you can see we had, we had actually a decent amount of growth in the fall. And in some cases like this or some parts, right, we've got enough sort of dead biomass to provide good soil coverage. But we've other got other parts where maybe we don't. So like that's kind of the risk. So I like, you know, so we picked spring barley, uh, but it also probably could have been oats. We see somewhat similar growth uh, between the two. We picked spring barley just because it had a little bit better growth in some of our earlier trials. But the nice thing about spring barley, right, is you don't have to go out and spray it. And so it winter kills, you've got this, you've got a little bit of soil coverage. It might not be perfect, um, but it's, uh, there, there might be some benefit to it and it's going to, um, certainly take up some nitrate in, in, in with its growth in the fall. 
We also used annual ryegrass, and this one was always a tricky one for us. So if anyone in the in the group here has more experience with annual ryegrass, um, be interested to know those experiences. But generally speaking, like we saw, sometimes it died, sometimes it doesn't or didn't, and then sometimes it kind of grew back patchy. And so it was just sort of the consistency of what it was doing across Wisconsin winters was 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 variable. So is it, yeah, is it useful if we don't can't really predict it? And that's kind of what I struggle with with annual ryegrass, right? Because you got spring barley, always winter kills. And then we go to winter rye, which in all of our trials always survives the winter. All right, so we have species that we know do one or the other. Annual ryegrass kind of fell in that middle ground. Uh, here, right, so this is in the spring. Now we've got a lot of bio, we've got a lot of growth, um, continues to survive. We have a lot more soil coverage in the spring with a winter rye. So that's why, you know, winter rye is kind of the, the popular one. And it's it's for this reason. So as we think about the you know the amount of biomass that can grow, so we did research across you know this is Arlington kind of representing the South Central region, Lancaster representing kind of the Driftless region, Marshfield a little bit further north, and you can see that in most cases you know the winter rye generally had the the most biomass you know on average we're getting you know we're getting certainly above a ton of of dry matter, um, and, and in most cases you know we're 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 kind of averaging about a ton of dry matter across all the years. Barley, we couldn't really get to that ton, but you know, we can get anywhere between a thousand, maybe 1500 pounds. Annual ryegrass tended to have the lowest amount of biomass. So what does that mean? So we, in this case, we only collected the amount of biomass in the above ground biomass. And we looked at it for like how much nitrate or nitrogens in that, in the, in the biomass. So we can get about 80 pounds uh, on average, you know, with winter rye, when we're, we have that really high seeding rate, we get a lot of, a lot of growth. So, hey, wow, we just trapped 80 pounds of nitrogen in plant biomass that could have leached out. So, okay, so that's that's really great if we're talking water quality and reducing nitrate leaching. But now we've also trapped 80 pounds of nitrogen that won't be available to that next crop. So how bad is that? Right, and so we have this, you know, the big hypothesis, you know, that we had, and we, you know, for those that have had to, you know, write hypotheses, you want to make bold statements and try, you know, this. so our hypothesis was that cover crops only take up nitrogen from the manure that was going to leach out anyway, right? So the effect would be that it wouldn't matter, right? Because that nitrate that nitri was going to leach out, but the cover crops trapped it and it's going to have no effect. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case. So when, you know, ultimately we're rejecting this hypothesis. And here's an example of kind of a, uh, one of the rougher years um, when we of the study. So this is at Lancaster, right? And here is our response curve with no cover crop. So this was a year, and apologize for uh, metric units, but we're uh, you know we're working this up for publication and sort of the cleanest thing we had. But um, there was the nature of the response. This is yield. This is nitrogen rate. So you can see that basically there was really no effect of we didn't really need to add any more nitrogen. That was a good sign. It means it was a situation where there was a lot of the manure that was applied in the fall definitely carried over and supplied nitrogen to that next crop. We actually didn't need any more nitrogen. Um, and so in these cases, we're putting probably about 10,000 gallons of, of N in the manure. It's supplying um, maybe about 100 pounds, 90 to 100 pounds of nitrogen. So it's a case where like there's plenty of nitrogen in the system. So great. What a great thing to happen. Okay, so, but we put out that winter rye cover crop and then we follow it with corn and yep, yields all right, were cut in half when we didn't apply any nitrogen. Definitely needed some nitrogen here. Um, and in fact, it needed about 115 more pounds of nitrogen to maximize yield. So we had to apply a lot more nitrogen. In fact, this is a case where on paper, it would have the cover crop would have effectively wiped out that manure nitrogen credit. So if you're doing nutrient management planning and you put in that amount of nitrogen that you're expecting to be there, that cover crop wiped it out. Um, and here's the pro bigger problem is that we saw a big yield decrease. Now this this was one of our this was one of our worst case scenarios. This was a case even two where the biomass, there was a lot of biomass here. We had a hard time um, getting our 
um, planter. Uh, it was just really hard to no-till plant into that setup. It was hard, you know, we, but it was also something that we've worked to really improve. So that the big lesson for this is that, okay, if, if you're following that cover crop, you need to think about your night manure nitrogen credits, but then especially if you're, if you're going to no-till drill, you got to really have that, that dialed in. Your planter setup has to be, um, has to be really good. So here we didn't really have that. We, we, did, we underestimated how good of no-tillers we needed to be. And so uh, we got to be better no-tillers as, as we went on. But, but that was the big, the big lesson on that one. Okay, so what's driving this at the end of the day? So, okay, how do you know, you got all this biomass that's out there. How do you know something you know, negative is gonna happen? Well, first thing is there is a relationship between the amount of biomass that's there. And so we graphed here. So this is the amount of total biomass, pounds per acre. This is the change. So the Delta means a change in maximum yield. So that's between a cover crop and the no cover crop. So it would imply like this, this point right here, this green triangle would imply, well, there wasn't a lot of biomass there, but actually it reduced yields by a little over 10 bushels, right? Um, over here, you know, we're looking at, you know, this blue square, we're looking at about over a ton of, you know, over a ton of dry matter uh, and reduced yields by about uh, by 10 bushels. So overall, there's generally a, a, a little bit of a yield drag following these cover crops. Um, and the relationship actually wasn't that strong. So when we do this kind of regression analysis, you know, we're looking at these R squared. So the R squared is kind of a good way to think about it is what percent of the variation does one variable, you know, how much does one variable control the other variable? So in this case, how much did cover crop biomass control the yield? Well, only about 11% of that, of the yield variation was controlled by the biomass. It's, it was generally negative, but it wasn't highly predictive. Okay, so it's, there's bio, there's a, there's a risk by just kind of, you know, there's, there's an issue of just having it out there that we need to kind of, kind of work on. So, you know, most of the, you know, we have this whole range of stuff here. So there's a lot of stuff that we can dial in, no-till planting. Um, we always waited, uh, you know, 10 to 14 days, well, the, the longer you can wait, I know it's not always ideal, but the longer you can wait between termination and planting, that's going to be a huge consideration. Hey, Matt. Yeah. This is Josh. We had a couple questions come in before awesome. we, yeah, before we get any further. Uh, the one question was, I guess they both were back to that um, chart you had that showed the 40 uh, bushels of yield. Yeah, mm -hmm. that chart. Um, one of the questions was, uh, based on like the termination timing of that of that rye, you know, if you were to terminate that sooner, um, what would you have for an expectation of of end requirement? Right. So the the so there's two angles to the terminating soon, and that's always yeah, and that that's another big lesson. Prioritize those fields with cover crops to get them terminated uh, as early as you can in the spring. So, I mean, you get, you're, everyone's going to balance it against, you know, maybe some of their conservation goals, but those certain, certainly should be prioritized. So if you, so issue one is, well, if you terminate early, does that mean there's less biomass that can get put on? That would be a good thing. Because you really only need, and we'll get into some, some, we'll get, we'll show a little more data on exactly how much biomass uh, you might need. But you want, you just need enough. You don't need to have a, you don't need to have even have a ton, a two thousand pounds of dry matter. You don't need to have that much. Um, you know, you want to have so getting it terminated early to reduce that. Then you know, term, but after that, then terminating early, it's really about that time, you know, the ten to fourteen day window. You know, post that, generally that reduces any sort of those negative effects that might be allelopathic, might be connected to to something else. So getting that cover crop, that you know, this material kind of breaks down. So that the timing, but you know, the timing between planting, you know, termination, and planting, you know, the longer you can have there, that would be better. So if you can terminate as early as possible, then you have kind of a longer window. So that's, those are sort of the two angles. So terminating early to reduce the total amount of biomass while still maintaining a little bit of soil coverage in the spring. Yeah, it always works out great because we always have, you know, super nice dry springs. That's so <laughs> you can just go out whenever you want. 
right? But it's something like, yeah, if you have some fields that you've really noticed those that cover crop really took off in the fall, you're going to want to definitely keep an eye and prioritize those fields. Okay, I think that I think that helps, and um, you know, Brian can follow up if if we missed something on that. And this this same uh, slide, Matt, is uh, from one year's worth of data from one trial. Just one year's. Yep, this is one year's worth of data. We've got um, you know we've got a lot of data points, and it's just from winter rye. Okay. Right. So you know, across we've got three locations over three growing seasons, three cover crops, right? So we've got 27 kind of curves we could look at like this. I always just like to demonstrate, yes, there, uh, there's a, there is a, a, some things that can be really detrimental that can happen that, you, that we need to address first. I think that you know, the, the overall power of cover crops to achieve our conservation and maybe water quality goals and maybe some soil health goals are, are true. But it just, this does just highlight that there is a risk there. Um, that we got to pay attention to, but I, but we can overcome this risk. Okay. We'll, we'll let you keep going okay. and keep and keep an eye on the, the uh, chat. Yeah. So yeah, keep, uh, yeah. So as people think about stuff, so, right. So you got the cover crop, I yeah, keeping it low, but really what the, the, so the next thing is there was, what about the biomass? So that, that affected yield, right. A little bit. And we can work on as so the, you know as we get as we got better and better. See, I'm a, I'm a researcher, right? And so it takes me a while to get good at farming. And so over time, we got better and better at sort of managing this, right? And I, that's kind of one of the lessons uh, too. Like if if you've seen any of the data out of like Practical Farmers of Iowa earlier on when they were doing these cover crop trials on farmer fields, they were seeing a bit of a yield drag. But over time no-till planter setups got better. Um, people started more consistently using uh, starter fertilizer, uh, you know, starter fertilizer, moving their nitrogen applications up a little bit in season to, to help with some breakdown. So over time, you know, the, the trend is, and with most of these studies and most of these experiments is to see that kind of that reduction in yield effect kind of go away, except in the conditions like when it's real, the really big biomass, those are really kind of the problems. So the other thing is how much nitrogen do you need? So this is the economic optimum nitrogen rate. So they, the total amount of nitrogen that, that you would need. And again, it's the delta or the change relative to no cover crop. So in this case, if it's zero, if the, if the data points are on zero, it would imply that there's no difference in the optimum end rate between that cover crop, you know, those cover crop plots versus no cover crop. If it's negative, interestingly, we did see a few, it meant that you actually could apply less nitrogen. But you'll see for the vast majority of the situations, it was a positive value. So implying we needed more nitrogen following a cover crop. And we're seeing, you know, highly variable again with an R squared of only about 0.15, right? So 15%, 15% of the variation is controlled by the uh, by the biomass, but really you can see like most of the risk when you have a lot of biomass, you know, it's a, a greater percent of the time leads to that, you know, greater nitrogen need. So we're looking at things again that are, are messy, right? In general, right, weather conditions affect a lot of what's going on with these sort of data sets. But in general, the more biomass, the more nitrogen you might you might need. We also measured the, uh, we basically took a pre-plant nitrate test. So basically the total amount of nitrate in the soil across at two feet at the time of cover crop termination. Now keep in mind, this was all, the, all of these ones had a fall manure application. We generally do not promote the pre-plant nitrate test to be collected after, if there's been manure applied, right? We promote the side dress, pre-side dress nitrate test because um, it's a little more in season to look at availability. But what we want here, we're interested in like, well, how was more nitrogen needed if this is the delta nitrate? If how much less nitrogen as nitrate was in the soil at the time of cover crop termination? Because the cover crop may have, you know, is depleting that root zone of, of available N. And that's what happens. You know, most of the time we're seeing less nitrate you know, most of the time we're seeing between zero and 50, and there's kind of like a small effect here. But generally speaking, once you get kind of past 
you know, that reduction in 50, there's 50 pounds less nitri nit nitrate nitrogen in the soil. That's where we see, yeah, we definitely need more nitrogen. So, so the story may not be entirely about how much cover crop biomass is happening, but what the, what the net effect is of the cover crop in the soil, right? How much, how much nitrate are we starting with? So it kind of leads to, especially if you have, if you're interested in, uh, in testing some things, especially with cover crops, maybe taking a pre-plant nitrate test at the time of cover crop termination might be an interesting thing, especially for those that are interested in cover crops, I would always recommend like put in a strip without cover crop. All right. Use that as a, as a, as a way to test against what sort of effects that you need to overcome. Right. Is it the amount of, you know, are you sure you're getting, you know, are there getting any yield drag? Uh, how hard is it to, uh, to, to plant into, uh, and what sort of, what are the soil nitrate conditions? How much nitrates in that soil that you're planting into as well? So it, it kind of like, you know, we're kind of doing a lot of promotion of this, you know, and there's a lot of people that are trying these on-farm experiments, but it's, kind of, there's going to be a lot of value. If you're using a cover crop, just putting out a strip without a cover crop, or maybe splitting a field, taking a few samples, you're going to get a lot of information out of that. So, and happy to, and always happy to chat with anyone that's interested in setting up a real simple trial like this too. Okay, so at the end of the day, we put together, you know, a, a, some of these recommendations related to, okay, you're following a nutrient management plan. You put out manure nitrogen in the fall. Of course, interestingly, uh, you know, we don't create any adjustments for manure N availability based on timing of application. But if we're going to put it, if you're going to put that manure out in the fall, the total amount of, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we're, we're the biomass is, uh, it, it, there is a little bit of a relationship. We kind of, put some general guidelines together here. If you have, in general, if you have less than about a thousand pounds of dry matter biomass, we're not really seeing a big effect of, of how of you need to apply more nitrogen. Um, and that said, you know, where we're, uh, and that's, you know, most of the time we saw less than a thousand, that's also mostly associated with cover crops that winter killed, the annual ryegrass and the spring barley. So that's another potential benefit, especially if you're maybe working with some, maybe you're working with farmers, or maybe you want to try out some cover crops. Maybe those ones that winter kill are kind of like the, the ones to start with, right? And then uh, if you have over 2,000 pounds of dry matter, in general, there is uh, most of the time, it wiped out the manure nitrogen credit. The really, you know, that the difference between the optimum end rate was basically equivalent to or greater than the amount of N that we would expect to be available from the manure. And then we kind of have a mid-range where we kind of, you know, it's kind of a mid-range here where if it's one to two, you know, subtract about 35 pounds. You're gonna to wanna to supplement, it's not gonna wipe out the credit, but you may need to supply a little bit more nitrogen in season. Um, and again, that was generally always the case with winter rye. If it was, if you got, if we got over a thousand pounds with some of the fall of the, the, the winter kill cover crops, not an effect. So most of these effects, you know, in this range where you need to supplement more nitrogen really come from that winter rye. That winter rye puts on a lot more growth, takes up a lot more nitrogen in the spring. And, uh, uh, and you just need to supplement it. So it kind of makes sense, right? The cover crops take up the nitrogen and we gotta, we gotta replace it. Now we, you know, and here we've got, uh, you know, uh, other recommendations along this, right? Terminate rise early as possible. We talked about that a little bit. And what about lowering the the seeding rate? Um, but before we get into seeding rates, we uh, want to talk about like well, we've also we're so we developed all of these recommendations out in the uh, out at our experiment stations, right? Now we're working on testing them on farmer fields. And so I'll share just a little bit of data with you too. But you know where does this general recommendation kind of fit? So here's an example. We, we have a trial up in Northeast Wisconsin. We got about 300 pounds of dry matter biomass. So not a, not a lot, not a ton, literally not a ton, not very much. But here, uh, so this is yield. This is the total N applied the following year. So following no cover crop, here's our nitrogen response here. And you can see that 
uh, you know, maximum yields were about the same. But we could also, interestingly, we saw a little bit of a, a flipped effect where we have the rye, we actually got better yields at, at, with less nitrogen uh, following that rye cover crop. So, you know, we keep doing these studies, we're going to find all these interesting anomalies, but that's on a pretty heavy uh, uh, clay soil. Um, so there was a little bit of, of a potential even overall benefit uh, in that system. Now we go to southern Wisconsin, and we got about 1,500 pounds of dry matter biomass. And this was a couple of years ago, and but we didn't get a lot of rainfall at this site. So we can think about what sort of effects we might see this year, right? We haven't talked much about water, but cover crops also take up water. So this is a case where it was fairly droughty conditions. We only, you know, we only could get up to 80 bushels following a cover crop, um, you know, regardless of how much nitrogen we applied versus, you know, certainly we had a, you know, these aren't fantastic yields, but we got greater yields um, and, and kind of a more, you know, when we're, especially at the higher end rates when we didn't use a cover crop. So this was a case of like cover crops take up water. And it, and that effect was exacerbated. Now you know down at this level, um, you know bad things are going to happen. We've we've got more. You know we've got on farm trials this year. Um, let's see let's see what happens. But it also highlights what the risk is for for some of this uh, for cover crop use when we're going into it, and then we get long stretches uh, where we're not getting that nitrogen or I'm sorry that water you know replacing that soil profile. So. Another another sort of hidden risk we don't talk a lot about because you know we can think about how many and how many years of ten is it gonna is this a one out of every ten year type situation is it one out of fifty is it five out of ten you know so those are sort of the risks when it comes to water that we also need to need to think about. Hey Matt, a yeah. question question came in. I think it's relevant here. Uh, it, it asks about the. Um, Di Diane asks about a way to estimate the amount of biomass in the field. Um, is there is there a way that we can look at that and get an idea on the nitrogen that may be, you know, kind of locked up in that biomass? Or are we going to be needing to take some cuttings and dry down and kind of sample that? Yeah, you know, right now, um, you know, that, that's a good question. Right now, I don't have a recommendation other than just to put out a put out a square know your area do a quick cut and dry it down and weigh it um we may have some um we're also we're we're, we're working with a group of researchers in the Midwest to get like how can we estimate it and if you and it may be we may be able to do that through like an NDVI you know those handheld uh NDVI measurements um but otherwise right now that's our that's our main approach. We can't, we couldn't just do it off of like a percent cover, like using like a Canopio app. I'm not sure that's going to be, that will be good to get like your percent soil coverage. But for now, you know, plant biomass sampling is 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 the way to go. We are working on trying to figure out if we, if we can get some simple assessments to, to estimate it. But Okay, that helps. And then um, <clears throat> a little bit of follow up on another question that I had asked, uh, and that is the amount of time that it takes for that cover crop to release that nitrogen back to that back to the growing crop. Um, are we are we talking about weeks, um, whereas like the termination timing isn't really going to make a lot of difference, or, or are we um, you know, talking about even a longer period of time yet where we're going to be waiting pretty late into the year to get that end back. So you, so if it is a rye cover crop, you are not getting that nitrogen back that growing season. So we have to think about you're trapping it and storing it sort of, right? So the grass cover crops are trapping the nitrogen and that nitrogen then is most likely going to be you know that it's going to be in that plant biomass more likely to be incorporated into your soil organic matter pools but it's not going to be released back anytime in that growing season right because we see most of these effects we need more nitrogen right so it's trapping it but it's not it's not providing it it's not providing it back um 
you know, most of our end response curves, you know, look a lot like this, where we need, we need more, more nitrogen. So, so that's going to be the struggle of the, the, the grass cover crops. The grass cover crops are there for, for conservation. And I've got, a, I've got a few more uh, thoughts on that as well. Like even here, like this is a case where there was a little bit of a benefit, but uh, you know, this is the, this sort of effect tends to be a little rare. The, this, the effect where you need a little more nitrogen that tends to be, uh, that tends to be the case. So what's interesting about this is that, you know, so it's different than legume cover crops. Like legumes, they release nitrogen pretty quickly. So those cover crops when they decompose release nitrogen quickly and, and have nitrogen available, but the grasses, the grasses do not. So uh, you can't you can't expect it to uh, you can't expect any nitrogen released in season from those grass cover crops. That helps a lot, Matt. Thanks. But that that's a great question because it does tie into this idea that the cover of what these cover crops are doing. And you have to supplement nitrogen back. And so is this a good or bad thing, right? And so I try to make, you know, I try to make cases for both. So the case for good is we have a lot of manure that needs to be land applied at some point. And we'd rather have the manure tied up in plant biomass rather than leach out. So, and for those that might not be taking manure nitrogen credits anyway, then they'll never really know. If you're applying a lot of nitrogen in season, you would never you would not necessarily see that effect, right? Because if you're already applying, if you put on fall manure and then putting out another 150, 200 pounds of nitrogen, you may never see a negative effect. So um, that's the case for good. Yeah, it takes it up, and then we don't have to. And then we'll just we'll manage we'll manage the nitrogen through commercial nitrogen or inorganic nitrogen. So the case for bad is that you know it reduces the economic value of the applied manure. Right, and that's one of the things we're always trying to promote, which is true, right? There's economic value of manure, but um, if you use cover crop with it, it reduces the value of it. So and this is the case, this is kind of gets at the, some of that previous, those previous questions. So when it comes to cover cropping, nitrogen is the price to be paid for the conservation benefits in dairy-based cropping systems. So you get erosion control, you get benefits to water quality, you're getting, you know, if you consistently use cover crops, you can get some long-term benefits to organic matter or soil health, but the, the price to be paid is nitrogen, All right? So, so nitrogen's the, the um, always on the, the sort of the negative side of that. That's the price. I don't know. I, that's kind of the way I've been talking about it. So um, it's, if you're not, if you want to gain value on that nitrogen side and nitrogen's a big input cost in our cropping systems, no doubt, um, so using cover crops, uh, do reduce sort of that economic return. But here's the problem, right? And this is the problem I don't have an answer for. <laughs> only, only just, I have more information to point out kind of the, the, let's not, let's not call it a problem, right? That's a challenge. Our great challenge with fall manure applications is if you put that manure out in the fall, is it guaranteed to be there? You put manure out in September, then October, November, December, January, February, March, April. Okay, now we're planting corn. How much nitrogen, is, is that nitrogen really going to be available? Is it going to stay there? So, and the answer is sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. So in all of these studies, I always had another treatment where I didn't put out manure. So I can calculate the nitrogen credit from the manure in any year, right? And so, and that means like I put out the manure in the fall, how much nitrogen compared to no manure, excuse me, compared to no manure, how much more nitrogen um, would I have to apply or how much, you know, would be, would be safe. So in this case, you know, if you're looking at this axis here, so I have anywhere of the manure basically contributing nothing, you know, or, or contributing very little, 20 pounds of nitrogen, all the way to the manure contributing, you know, almost to 100 or almost to 200 pounds of nitrogen. So you have cases where the manure that you know, manure was planned in the fall, and almost all of it was available to that next crop of what we predict. But then we have some conditions where we are applying, you know, we'd expect there to be about 100 pounds of nitrogen, and there's less than 50 pounds of nitrogen that actually was supplied to the 
to the crop, right? It's just the risk. You're putting out a, a nitrogen source really far in advance. The predictability goes way down, right? So it makes sense fundamentally. So what I have graphed here though, is against the extra nitrogen needed following a cover crop. And this, these are all for winter rice. So you can think about in cases, the way, the way to interpret this graph. So when the manure nitrogen credit is high, meaning that that manure was gonna supply a lot of nitrogen to the corn, the effect of that cover crop was also huge, right? Because that cover crop took up that nitrogen and the manure was gonna be available. And so you needed to supplement back a lot of nitrogen. But in cases where the manure wasn't really supplying a lot of nitrogen because it all leached out, the effect of that cover crop was also relatively minimal. Meaning, if you have a, you think about you apply that manure and you've got that nitrate in the soil profile. And if that nitrate leaches out or gets taken up by a cover crop, the net effect is the same. There's very little nitrate in the soil profile, right? So if that's the case, then, and if there's the risk of it, you know, there's risk of it all leaching out, and then we'd rather have it trapped in that cover crop biomass and incorporated, you know, hopefully it gets incorporated into the soil organic matter pools and, and stuff like that. Except sometimes it's, you know, the manure doesn't leach out, right? And so the manure, the cover crop takes it up and there's a lot, and there's a lot of nitrate still available. Um, so uh, it certainly demonstrates uh, that the risk or the, the, the drawback to a cover crop is dependent on if that manure nitrogen leached out or not. And the problem is we don't have, we don't, you know, we don't have a lot of data to provide those estimates. Like in this case, you know, we're looking at maybe about 50% of the time. Um, if, if it had a, a, a big, you know, a, a, a big effect on, on nitrate leaching. So uh, it's something that we actually need to probably uh, address more and, and do, do more work on. So that's kind of, I mean, that's a stopping point here too. I don't know if anyone has, if there's any other questions coming in, otherwise I can share just a you know, some little bit more info. Uh, Matt, so there is a question on seeding yeah. rate. So it would be good to get to, get to this. Perfect. Uh, but there is a question as well about rye legume mixtures mm -hmm. um, to kind of have the best of both of the things that we talked about as far as, you know, take up some N, but also being able to, release it to the following crop. So I don't know if that yeah. fits in here yet or if that's something you no. want to And so, the, I mean, the problem is, so if you think about after corn silage, we don't, we just, we haven't got six, we don't have good success of getting that, that those cover crops, the legume cover crops planted after harvest, um, especially if we're looking at, you know, mid to late September, it's too late to really get a, a good stand of the legume cover crop uh, growing. So the stuff that we've sort of experimented with that might be worth trying is to interseed, right? And so uh, you interseed the legumes like a red clover in between the rows of corn that covered the, the red clover does a fairly good job of like getting out of the ground and just hanging out. And then if you, if you get it going a little bit and then harvest the corn silage and, and open it up, then there might be a benefit. So the problem is, Sometimes we see, I still haven't seen a, a, a like a significant amount of growth where, where it's that it, where it's growing. It, you have to get a lot of biomass to get a lot of nitrogen supplied. And so we still struggle with a way of how to get enough, put on enough biomass with those legumes in that sort of setup to produce a lot of nitrogen. If you've got winter wheat, get you've got a tremendous opportunity to get, you know, if you can get those, if you can get those uh, legumes planted in, in August. They're gonna they're gonna grow really well, but if they're um, in September, we've just had it. Just is too hard. Just they they take a while. They take a while to get going. Now, if you're also willing to let that, or maybe, or if you're willing to let that red clover grow into the spring a little bit more, you know, if you want to wait in the spring to, for it to put on more biomass, there might be an opportunity. But you're gonna have, you might have to wait a little bit in the spring. So it's just that's more experimental, and we just haven't found a good setup to grow a lot of legume biomass um, in corn silage systems. All right, that helps, thanks. So then the other thing too as well, right? So there's risk, <clears throat> one opportunity to reduce costs, but also maybe reduce the total amount of biomass is to just reduce seeding rates. So, right, if um, 
we've uh, we also followed this up with a study where we compared four different seeding rates of the cover crop biomass, 30, 60, 90, 120. You know, typically we'd been applying between 60 to 90, you know, some of our earlier cover crop work would really kind of pushing towards the high end because we just wanted to ensure there was growth and then we ended up putting on a ton of growth. Um, but you can see, so we put on, this is the amount of, uh, this is one of the, let's see, this would have been 2021, uh, the amount of cover crop biomass in the spring of 2021. You can see, you know, more than 60 pounds, the, the total amount of biomass plateaued, you know, and, you know, really we got a good amount of biomass with a thousand pounds of dry matter biomass with only about 30 pounds per acre of a seeding rate. And then you can compare that to what you might see, you know, in terms of soil coverage. So we go from 30, or so we got 60% soil coverage and about 1,000 pounds of dry matter with 30 pounds of seeding. You go up to 60, we got another 12% coverage and another mm, 300 pounds of biomass. So there's, you know, but nothing past 60, right? So that's 60 pounds. Seem to be the best, and also you know thirty seemed okay. So actually, somewhere in a thirty to sixty um, might be might be might be good. Um, and we're looking at uh, just total amounts to end there. We did it again. We saw a little bit of a different effect. We saw the the total biomass kept increasing as the as our seeding rate went up, except you know that's in the biomass side. But what's interesting is that the soil coverage side, so we have a little more biomass this year than we did with others. Once you get to a cup, once you get past like a certain threshold, the, the coverage side doesn't really matter anymore, right? So now we got 75% coverage with only about 30 uh, pounds per acre. So what's interesting about the seeding rate, right? If we're drill, we're, we're drill seeding these, right? So it's still on those, you know, um, seven and a half inch, you know, row spacings. So all you're doing is really moving the seed closer together in the rows, right? So they kind of fill in, right? So then it, it sort of just gets your basic agronomy stuff. The tighter you pack stuff in, the less growth per plant, you spread them out a little bit, you get more growth per plant. And sometimes those things sort of equal out. Um, so in this case, you know, yeah, you can, if you really want to maximize your growth and your coverage, but there's probably, you know, in terms of your bang for your buck on the conservation side, you know, 30 to 60 is probably, you know, kind of where, where you'd want to be at. Um, what's interesting too, is that, you know, the other thing that we did is that when we looked at, we also looked at uh, in the second year, we did above ground biomass, but then we also collected root biomass and they're a little bit variable, but it, you know, in most cases uh, the root biomass in some cases nearly doubled the amount of total biomass that is actually growing out there. And then we're looking at anywhere between 60 to 90 pounds of total end uptake. So again, you were talking about, well, we don't necessarily want 90, right? We want coverage. We want some nitrogen uptake, but we don't necessarily need to maximize it. And so again, we're, we're getting, you know, between 30 and 60, we're getting between, you know, 60 to 80 pounds of total end uptake. We're already dang near maximizing our overall potential benefit, right? So even with 30 pounds of, at a seeding rate, we're getting 60 pounds of nitrogen uptake. And that's that's a real benefit to, to the system. So um, I think that if you're, you know, what's the lesson here is that I think you can, we can start with a lower rate. So my, you know, my big take home messages. So as you're thinking out there, someone wants to experiment with cover crop, you want to experiment with a cover crop, try spring barley or oats. Right, you get them planted, see how, see how well they're growing uh, across different seasons for you. It's a good starter cover crop. They're winter kill, right? You don't have to get out and manage every, anything. You don't have to spray again, right? So it's also a little. Then you can think about like, are you getting the benefits you want in the spring? So it's just a good place to start and get you kind of thinking about, you know, are are you getting the benefits you want to see? Is this is it even worth doing? Are you still having erosion issues, uh, control issues in the spring? If not. But if not, and you're getting enough dead biomass coverage, then you might be okay. Um, but that winter ride provides uh, soil coverage throughout the spring. So if that's your main issue, so like you, you need that spring erosion control, then winter ride is probably your best bet. Um, you always need to adjust your manure. You know, you generally need to adjust your manure nitrogen credits with using winter rye. Um, get those estimates of biomass. Um, and I would say there's no real value in seeding it above 60, and you could even cut back, back a bit. So 
you know, if you want to start with uh, with winter rye, start at maybe 50, 60, and then work back from there, or maybe the other way, start with 30 and work up, um, you know, um, but we, so we've seen really good, really good growth with, with 30. And then, you know, again, there's real risk with fall applied manure, right? We don't probably talk about this enough of like, what's that, what's the real manure nitrogen? How do you know that nitrogen's there in the spring? You know, other than, you know, we have a pre-side dress nitrate test that you, you could take and that'd be even further in season. But the idea of ensuring that any manure that's applied in early September, early to mid-September is still going to be there. It's not 100%, you know, maybe a little bit closer to, to 50% of, 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 uh, of what we'd expect. So if that's the case, are we just better off of sort of, in some cases, thinking about manure as a waste stream? I know we got to think about it as a nutrient and I want to encourage that. But if we are thinking about it as a waste stream, let's trap it with a cover crop. So it could be some uh, some win-wins here um, with these setups. Because in certain cases, if we got to get manure out in the fall, then let's trap it. That'd be my my advice. The overall net benefit uh, to the region would be would be beneficial. So there you go. So a lot, so a lot of stuff to think about. Um, you know, it's a lot of, it's a lot of experimenting. Um, you know, I think that there's certainly there's a lot more cover crop, probably planting than there than there used to be. And uh, and I'd like to see it. I think that'd be a great goal for for Wisconsin: million acres of cover crops. You know, overall net benefit, get it used over time. I think it would be a good step in helping us with some of our water quality issues, um, as well as help. There's a benefit to the soil. So, Matt, there's a follow up, follow up question, Matt, on yeah. your seeding rates. Um, were those all drilled seeding? Seedings? Yeah, yes. So, all of these, the, the other idea too is that because we're working with cover crops and the idea of it as a conservation system. We tended to uh, well. One is we we uh, it was working across a kind of a no-till phase of 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 rotation. If not, you know, or when we're working on farm, there a lot of long-term no-tillers. But yeah, but you can get. I would. It'd be, it's a great if if you're getting these. Uh, you can. Uh, well, sorry, I'm stumbling over my words here because there's a couple angles to it. One is you can seed at a lower rate when you drill. Two, you can ensure a better stand establishment when you drill. Um, but, uh, you know, you've also, and you have a little bit better, you know, better window to, to get those um, things going in, in September after corn silage. So not that you can't broadcast seed and not that it would be a complete disaster by any means, um, but you can just, you just sort of get just a little bit better establishment and, you know, a little more consistency. All right, thanks. One more, one more question, Matt, and then maybe you can, once you close your slides down, maybe you'll be able to see the chat and go back through just oh, a little yes. bit. Um, the the last question we have is, how would you compare the soil reduction, soil erosion reduction benefit from a living cover crop compared to that that winter killed cover crop? All right. So, uh, so uh, say that again. How yep. Sorry. Compare? How would you compare the reduction in soil erosion um, from a, a winter kill cover crop where you just have that biomass compared to one where you have that living plant in the spring? So, so you you, you, you can't you can't really compare it without seeing it, right? So it's uh, in in my experiences. And again, it'd be interesting to see others. It's sort of like, what's your visual assessment of that dead biomass coverage, right? You Coverage is, you know, you, you can see what coverage is. So in some years, that cover crop, it was a nice thick mat, you know, and in the spring, it was, it looked like that's going to have some, some benefit. Other springs, it seemed like everything dried out pretty quick. It just sort of like those, uh, the grasses kind of crumbled apart. There was no real, no real soil protection there. Uh, so it just kind of, it just depends. The more by I would see in general, the more biomass you put on the fall, the better the odds that you'll have dead biomass erosion control in the spring. But, you know, it's, uh, again, it's variable. So it'd just be something you'd want to, you'd want to test out and see, you know, what stuff's looking like your fields, 
how much are you getting enough biomass growing that you feel like it's having a benefit and then obviously just you know taking some looks in the spring and see see how much it's it's actually helping or not all right thanks yeah, a lot. sorry go ahead yeah i just ask thank you uh Dr. Rourke, will you be at the Manure Expo with some of these uh, things that you talked about? I will absolutely be at the Manure Expo. We'll talk cover crops and we'll talk uh, we'll talk more in-depth stuff on soil health as well. Perfect. Uh, Matt, if you don't have to head anywhere right away, maybe take a peek at the chat. Um, we're going to get through a few other items here quickly before we let everybody else go. And yeah, like, like I said, if you can stick around, may, maybe there's some more questions and conversations to have. Um, but we're going to, uh, sorry, thank you very much for the presentation today. I don't want to miss that. Um, I'm going to turn it over quick to Jerry to talk about uh, a couple of things that are coming up here. Um, I guess the slide he has up now is a uh, special that we have this Friday, um, talking about that topic of drought. Um, hopefully there was a lot of rain received across the state here this morning and early afternoon, but we're going to visit this Friday, um, a little different start time for us. We're going to start at 10. Um, go ahead and, you know, reg register if you want to uh, learn a little bit more about some of those topics listed there. And give Jerry a few minutes to talk about the Manure mm -hmm. Expo at this time. Sure. The question was brought up if Matt's going to be at the Manure Expo, and yes, he is. He's one of our uh, speakers uh, at the uh, on the uh, August 10th day, but it's a two-day event. So if you've never been to the uh, North American Manure Expo, we're going to be at the Arlington Research Station at the Blaine Dairy Facility, so right there on Badger Lane, uh, parking close by, as well as the field demonstrations and the vendor exhibitor area. So we'll have some uh, tours on August 9th, uh, doing some agitation and separator pelletizer type demonstrations, which are new this year. Uh, so we're looking at uh, four different companies are bringing in separators and one that actually pelletizes manure. So that'll be something interesting to look at. Uh, in the late afternoon, we're going to have a safety school as well as some networking opportunities uh, over at the uh, public events building. And then August 10th, uh, we have some educational sessions for a couple hours. That's where Matt's going to be at uh, in one of those tents, uh, providing some of that information. And then uh, during the afternoon, uh, late morning, early afternoon on the 10th, we got some solid manure application, liquid manure application, a hose break safety uh, demonstration, as well as rapid transfer with some of the dumpster technology that's out there. Um, so there will be CCA credits for all of these events, even the tours, as well as the um, the demonstrations. Uh, we also have a research poster session that uh, many students uh, will be, and researchers, especially through the uh, the Dairy Hub, will be presenting. And there will also be a ride and drive available on some GPS for hazard mapping um, out there as well. Uh, all of those sessions on this slide are, are going on both days. Um, so those will be there uh, the 9th and 10th. And then uh, there is no cost to uh, come into the facility or come into the the grounds and participate, but if you're going to participate in a tour, um, we need you to register for that. And there is a $25 fee as there's uh, maybe a bus charge for that or just some of the logistics and setting up some of those tours. Uh, lunch is available on the grounds as well. And so uh, hopefully we can see out there one of those days or maybe both uh, down at the Arlington Research Station in a couple of weeks. Um, I'm just going to move on, Josh. I'll just post the, uh, the QR code if you want to take us home from here. Yeah, sounds good, Jerry. Thank you. Um, so please go ahead and scan this if you would like to get um, some CCA credit today. Um, also, Sam will be putting a uh, link in the chat box if it's easier uh, to go ahead and click on that and just work on that on your desktop quickly. Um, just a really quick sur survey is all is all it is. You'll be able to, uh, you know, just put your information in and that'll all be taken care of. Um, uh, like I said, we are we are going to wrap up for today. Um, if you would like to hang around and ask some more questions, you know, go ahead and unmute yourself and and ask those questions. We're gonna we're gonna hang on for a bit. Um, we are going to take off um, in two weeks uh, because we do have the uh, manure expo kind of on about the same the same time as our pro program. Um, but about a month from now, actually, is when we'll check back. Um, Dr. Joe Lauer is going to be discussing some corn silage harvest preparation at that time. So 
hope we can see you all again again then. Thank you for joining today. If anyone has more questions, I'll, I can stick around for a few more minutes. Should I head out to a field day talk here in a minute? But and of course, if anyone's interested in doing any on-farm experimentation with anything, there's a lot of really straightforward types of setups to do where you can gain a lot of information about your soil, about you know, about your, the effects and um help us kind of also put together a bigger database on this information. Matt, what, what's some of your experience with planting a spring and a winter cereal crop together in the fall? Do, do we get a little bit of the best of both or, or not always? Uh, sorry, I was, I was, sorry, I was reading a, a oh, note that came in. What was your what, uh, winter wheat, yeah. did you say? If we, if we plant like a spring small grain, and a winter hardy small grain in the fall. Do we get a little bit of the best of both of those or is there more to learn about kind of how that uh, would certainly work? more to learn, maybe best of both worlds where it'll reduce the total amount of biomass put on and a little bit of coverage, right? So yeah, I mean, I don't know, right? And the problem is, is like, I can never, I never know how much biomass gets put on in the fall. I mean, it just depends. Like if the fall is great conditions, we can put on and, and keeps going. Then we get a, a lot of bio, a fall, a lot of fall biomass. Um, but other years where it's like, oh man, is this even going to, you know, this is going to amount to anything. And then it's all spring biomass. So um, I can't, you know, the, 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 you're, we're still at, you know, the, ultimately, yes. I think that, that setup is, is an interesting one too. Another one to kind of maybe start with and experiment with. Um, I think there could be some, some benefits of that, but then there won't be the benefit if it doesn't really grow that much in the fall anyway. So there was a question about saying there's no end credit. No, there's definitely isn't it. There's definitely an end credit and you'll get the bigger end credit. I was just saying, you don't have to wait the, the 10 to 14 days on, uh, 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 it, maybe if you, if you go, if you plant afterwards, so yeah, that's the, the big value. Like we can get, even with some of this, if you had a cover, a legume cover crop, like you planted after winter wheat. And if it's like a bursine clover or crimson clover and then it winter kills, that's going to supply, I mean, that'll still supply nitrogen. So that you get the biggest bang for the buck with that red clover or the legumes that would survive into the spring, the bigger the biomass, the more nitrogen that's, you know, been fixed and then would be returned, but, right, so it's just sort of, uh, uh, you know, what's your bang for the buck on, uh, if you want to manage it and go spray it in the spring, but yeah, if you want to grow a lot of nitrogen, that's the way to do it, let it grow into the spring, but I, in my experience, I've had a hard time getting it, do anything consistent other than planting it Frost seeding into winter wheat or planting it after winter wheat, or really, I guess you could plant it after canning crops and stuff like that too. So, but you got to have it in, got to have it in August. Love to be able to figure that one out. I'd love to be able to figure out how to get more legume cover crops grown because those are the ones that have just the clearest economic return and, you know, and a lot of bang for the buck. But consistency is the issue. We just run out of heat units. Right. We have some guidelines, you know, Midwest cover crop count or council yeah. and, and, you know, even throughout our state, there's dates, right. Where we maybe aren't going to really be expecting much growth and yeah, just the species that, that fit those. Um, yeah. Well, we've trickled down. Um, okay. Those of you that are still on, uh, we're, we're probably going to, Unless you have any questions, we're probably going to, you know, go ahead and just kind of slim down the group that's here and do a few internal things for a minute or two. All There's right. Th thanks thumbs for, up. Hey, that's a good way to end. Thanks for having me, too. That's fun. Thanks, Matt. All right. See you guys. See ya.
You want to? Sorry, sorry wanna... Josh, I didn't realize that second picture was hidden. I didn't unhide that. Oh, you didn't picture. unhide. Okay, that's, that's fine. Why, that's why it skipped. I'm like, and I was panicking to go backwards. So, <laughs> Sam, do you want to hit the stop record? Good call.